All right. Um, Madam Court Reporter, uh, if you will open the record, please, and uh, let us all come to order. Uh, I am Commissioner Dan Clodfelter, and I will be presiding at this uh, public hearing tonight. Uh, joining me, and if you'll raise your hand so folks who are watching on YouTube can see you on the screen. Joining me tonight uh, are Commission Chair Charlotte Mitchell, uh, Commissioners uh, Tanola Brown Bland, Lyons Gray, uh, Kim Duffley, Jeff Hughes, and Floyd McKissick Jr. Uh, the Commission will now call for hearing docket number E100 sub 165, which is uh, in the matter of the 2020 Biennial Integrated Resource Plan reports and the related 2020 Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard Compliance Plans for Duke Energy Carolinas, Duke Energy Progress, and Virginia Electric and Power Company doing business as Dominion Energy North Carolina. Uh, before we proceed further and as required by the State Government Ethics Act, I remind the members of the Commission that it is our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and inquire at this time as to whether any Commissioner has a known conflict of interest or appearance of such conflict with respect to the proceedings tonight. Madam Court Reporter, please let the record reflect that no one uh, identified any such conflicts. North Carolina General Statute Section 62-110.1c requires this Commission to develop, publicize, and keep current an analysis of the long-range need for electricity in this state. In order for the Commission to meet this requirement, we conduct an annual investigation into the integrated resource plans prepared by each of the principal electric utilities under the Commission's jurisdiction. In addition to that review, Commission Rule R8-67B requires electric public utilities to file a plan for renewable energy portfolio standard called a REPS compliance plan as part of their IRP reports. Uh, integrated resource planning, uh, sometimes referred to for shorthand as IRP, is intended to identify those electric resource options that can be obtained at the lowest cost to ratepayers consistent with safe, adequate, and reliable electric service. The utilities integrated resource plans must take into account and consider conservation, efficiency, load management, as well as supply side alternatives in the selection of their resource uh, por portfolio. The Commission does not approve or disapprove the utilities integrated resource plan. Instead, it takes them into consideration in its own long range plan for electricity service in North Carolina and also in its determination of applications for certificates of public convenience and necessity to construct new electric generating facilities and in other proceedings where approval of utility programs or capital investments is required by the general statutes. On May the 1st, 2020, uh, Dominion Energy North Carolina filed its 2020 uh, IRP and its 2020 REPS compliance plan. On September 1st, 2020, Duke Energy Progress and Duke Energy Carolinas filed their 2020 IRPs and 2020 REPS compliance plans. The public staff's participation as a party in this proceeding is recognized pursuant to General Statute 62-15D. And in addition, the participation of the North Carolina Attorney General in this proceeding is recognized pursuant to his notice of intervention filed under General Statute 62-20. Uh, the following parties have petitioned to intervene and have been granted right to intervene as, as formal parties by commission order. They are the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Asso uh, Association, Vote Solar Inc., the Carolina's Clean Energy Business Alliance, NC Warren Inc., the Center for Biological Diversity, the Carolina Industrial Group for Fair Utility Rates, the Carolina Utility Customers Association Inc., the Tech Customers, Broad River Energy LLC, the City of Asheville, Buncombe County, the City of Charlotte, the Sierra Club, the Natural Resources Defense Council, Electricities of North Carolina Inc., the North Carolina Eastern Municipal Power Agency, and the North Carolina Municipal Powers Agency Number 1. On February 2nd of this year, the Commission issued an order scheduling a public hearing conducted via WebEx on March 16, 2021, for the purpose of taking non-expert public witness testimony with respect to the IRPs and the REPS compliance plans. The order stated that members of the public desiring to testify must register in advance of the hearing no later than 5 p.m. on Thursday, March 11, 
2021 by contacting the public staff. Commission's order also required uh, the three utilities to publish notice of this hearing in newspapers having general coverage in their respective North Carolina service areas. Public staff received more than 200 requests to testify at the originally scheduled hearing. Commission was very pleased to have this level of interest, but determined that accommodating such a large number of witnesses via remote technology on a single evening presented logistical and technical challenges that could not be overcome. And therefore, the Commission issued an order on March 12, 2021, stating in part that persons who had registered to testify at the March 16 hearing would instead be heard on a series of sessions over several dates. On March 26, the Commission issued an order establishing six, six dates in April and May for the purpose of hearing non-expert non public witness testimony from persons who had registered with the public staff. And the Commission directed the public staff to evenly schedule the witnesses across the six evenings and to notify each person of the date he or she is to testify. And so that brings us tonight, which is the third uh, in the series of hearings, and to the process we will follow this evening to receive a public witness testimony. Over the past 12 months, the Commission has conducted several public hearings using remote video technology, and we have learned that such hearings can take longer and can sometimes be more complicated than the hearings that are conducted in person in the hearing room in Raleigh. And so in the interest of being able to hear from everyone who is scheduled to testify this evening, I urge you to respect and abide by the following procedures. First, the public staff has grouped the witnesses and has scheduled each group of witnesses for a specific date. The group scheduled for tonight's date are the only witnesses the commission will receive testimony from this evening. Once all the registered witnesses have testified, the hearing will recess and the next session will be held next week, May the 12th at 6 p.m. Second, public witnesses as they call in, as you dial in, will be on the telephone line, but they will not be displayed on the video screen available on YouTube. However, anyone who is participating in or observing tonight's hearing can watch the commission and the representatives of the companies and other parties via YouTube. The link to the YouTube video is available on the commission's website at www.ncuc.net. Uh, third, the public staff will call this evening's witnesses in the order in which they are registered to speak. When your name is called, at that point, our meeting technician will unmute your telephone line. When you hear two beeps on your telephone line, that means your line is unmuted and you're, you are then live in the meeting. I will next ask you to take an oath of affirmation. We will not be asking witnesses to swear on the Bible because obviously we can't physically do that tonight. So you will be asked to take an oath of affirmation. After you take the oath, the public staff attorneys will ask you a few introductory questions. And if you wanna save some time, you will be asked uh, to state your name, to provide your address, and to tell us which company provides your electricity service. Uh, and if you wanna go ahead and do that, as soon as you've taken the oath, uh, that can speed us up. If not, the public staff attorney will solicit that information from you. Immediately after those questions, you may proceed to make your statement. You will have five minutes to present your testimony. Uh, due to the number of witnesses that we have and the requirements of tonight's technology, I don't have uh, latitude really to allow you to go beyond your allowed time. Commissioner Brown Bland will be keeping time for us tonight, and she's got a very loud ringing uh, phone, uh, which we can all hear, that will let us know when your five minutes are up. To help you save your time, if you have something to say that you believe has already been said by an earlier speaker, you may want to simply refer to that testimony and say you would support the earlier speaker. And that allows you to use your five minutes to make different points or new points that haven't been said. If you have more information than you wish the commission to consider than you're able to provide in the allotted five minutes, please remember that you may file a supplemental written statement with the clerk. That statement will become the part of the record in these proceedings. You will be speaking to the commissioners who you'll be able to see on the YouTube link. After you've completed your statement, the commissioners and the attorneys for the parties will have an opportunity to ask you questions. So please don't hang up your telephone line until I have let you know whether or not any commissioner or party has a question they want to ask you. When you've completed your statement, and responded to any questions asked of you, your phone line will be put on mute again, 
and you are free to disconnect your line if you wish to do so. When you hear a single beep on your line, that means you have been muted. I encourage you to continue to watch and follow us on YouTube after you've completed your statement. Uh, and again, the link uh, to the YouTube uh, uh, link is available on the Commission's website. Finally, let me uh, touch on a couple of points that will help us avoid problems with the technology this evening. If you are using a cell phone, a portable phone, or a smartphone as your telephone uh, device, please be sure your device is fully charged or that you can keep it charged up during the course of the evening. The hearing could last several hours and you don't want to have your phone go dead if you are one of the later speakers on tonight's uh, speakers list. If you are watching us on YouTube and you're also connected to us by your telephone, please remember to keep your computer audio on mute to avoid feedback on your telephone line. If you're using your computer audio to dial in for the hearing and speak to us, please keep your computer audio on mute, except when you've been called on and recognized and are actually speaking. And last of all, be sure the volume level on the device that you're using is set high enough so that you can be heard. To those of you who are watching us on YouTube, uh, who may be speaking to us in one of the subsequent hearings, uh, let me advise you that the procedures I just went through uh, in, in just, just the last couple of minutes have now been posted on the Commission's website. So again, if you will go to the website, www.ncuc.net, there will be a tab for hearings. If you click on that tab, you can get access to the procedures that we follow for these remote public hearings. We didn't have that posted before uh, this session, but if you're speaking to us in, in some of the coming sessions, you can find out these protocols and get yourself prepared uh, to speak to us uh, from the Commission's website. Okay, with those preliminaries out of the way, I will call upon Council for the parties to announce their appearances for the record, and I'll begin with the companies. Uh, good, evening, good evening, members of the Commission. Uh, Robert Kaler, appearing on behalf of Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Progress. Thank you, Mr. Kaler. Good evening. Good evening, Commissioner Claude Pelter, Commissioners. Um, this is Andrea Kyles with the law firm of McGuire Woods, appearing on behalf of Dominion Energy North Carolina. Good evening, Ms. Kells. Thank you. Ms. Townsend? Yes, Teresa Townsend with the Attorney General's Office, representing the using and consuming public and also the state and its citizens in this matter of public interest. Um, I do not see on my screen any other intervener parties speak now or forever hold their peace. If so, we'll go to the public staff and, and recognize the public staff. Lucy Edmondson with the public staff on behalf of the using and consuming public. Also with me is Robert Josie. Good evening, both of you. Uh, again, I'll call out, are there any interveners, uh, council who are on the phone that I don't see on my screen who wanna make an appearance? If not, let me ask council, are there any preliminary matters that uh, you want us to address before we uh, begin hearing from the witnesses? Not from Duke Energy, no. Chair. Right, uh, Ms. Edmondson, uh, we'll start and let you call your first witness, please. Our first witness is Joel Porter. All right, Mr. Porter, can you hear me? I can, yes, can you hear me? I can do so fine, That's, uh, let's get you sworn in. Do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great, okay. My name is Joel, J-O-E-L, Porter, P-O-R-T-E-R, for the record. Uh, my address is 1015 Ketch Fly Lane, that's Ketch Fly Lane, Durham, North Carolina, 27713, and Duke Energy Progress, I believe, is my utility. Okay, you may proceed with your statement. Great, I'm getting a little feedback, so I apologize in advance. Uh, 10 years ago, Congress failed to act and implement comprehensive policies that would have put adequate measures in place to mitigate greenhouse gases. In the absence of real federal leadership and comprehensive policy, emissions have continued to contribute to our changing climate and exacerbate warming's effects. 
Now, power companies in the West, like PG&E, cannot obtain insurance to ground wires because of the increased risk that a spark will ignite dry ground cover and cause a catastrophic fire. Louisiana is currently, currently experiencing rolling blackouts due to increased stress from hotter days. Texas saw a nearly week-long blackout because of a snowstorm. And here in North Carolina, we're dealing with our own, our own climate issues. From more intense storms leading to flooding to landslides in the West, the list of climate-related costs that our communities are already experiencing as a result of the pollution from fossil fuel generation goes on and on and on. There is an inherent price on carbon, and that price is currently inadequate to account for the totality of risks that climate change poses both now and into the future. Bottom line, the integrated resource plan that Duke Energy submitted to this commission leaves rate payers on the hook for the cost they shouldn't bear. The RP will add significant amounts of gas generation to the grid. I remember back in 2007, utility companies told Congress that natural, natural gas would be the bridge fuel to cleaner energy sources. It's now 2021 and Duke Energy, Dominion, and other utilities are still trying to claim that natural gas will be a bridge to addressing climate challenge, challenges. Excuse me. That bridge is now 15 years long, making it the longest metaphorical bridge excuse ever constructed. And even though we ha now have affordable means of achieving the clean energy future we need, utilities keep trying to build that bridge a little longer. Interveners in this rate case have identified flaws in the modeling used, additional costs, i.e. the total societal costs of greenhouse gases that are currently unaccounted for, and issues with assumptions ranging from fuel price estimates to energy demand. In their yearly analysis of levelized costs of energy, the financial advisory and assets management firm Lazard lists, lists utility scale solar and wind generation as cost competitive with conventional sources of generation. In 2016, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory issued a report titled Rooftop Solar Photovoltaic Technical Potential in the United States, a detailed assessment. This report modeled how much energy potential exists in the United States if we install solar on every capable rooftop in the nation. In North Carolina, the modeling found that we could generate 35 gigawatts of our state's electricity demand from solar if we maximize total generation capacity. The 8.6 gigawatts Duke's IRP proposes to have installed by 2030 leaves 26.4 gigawatts of solar potential on the table. Duke's attention to its responsibility to maintain grid resili resiliency and reliability is appropriate. However, we believe there are clean energy solutions that do maintain those attributes in a least cost way that were not presented in the IRP, especially in light of the bipartisan legislation that Congress passed late last year that addressed renewable energy tax extenders. We believe the Commission should require Duke Energy to re revise their assumptions based on goals set, under, set out under Governor Cooper's Executive Order 80 and submit an IRP that reduces reliance on legacy fossil fuel generation. Further, we believe the Commission and its long-term planning should prioritize increasing the amount of energy efficiency and demand side management technology added to the grid, allow competitive energy procurement for ratepayers, allow for community solar to be added to the grid, and maximize the number of renewable interconnections done. In short, Duke Energy in North Carolina can and should be more aggressive at adding affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy resources to the grid. North Carolinians deserve more from one of the largest utilities in the country. Thank you very much. I appreciate the Commission's attention. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Let's see, uh, do any of the parties or members of the Commission have questions that they want to ask Mr. Porter? Mr. Porter, I uh, don't think anyone has any questions, so we thank you for being with us tonight. The pleasure is mine. Thank you. Ms. Edmondson, who's next? Not the second witness is Laurie O'Loughlin. Uh, Ms. O'Loughlin, can you hear me? Not the second witness is Laurie O'Loughlin. Your audio is a little garbled. Uh, try, try again. Yes, I can. Your audio is a little uh, now, we're getting some interference on the line, so let's uh, let's try again, Ms. Ms. Can you hear me now? I can hear you much better now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's right. get you sworn, please. Thank you. Uh, do, let's get you sworn, please. Do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you will give this evening 
Should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay. My name is Lori O'Loughlin. My address is 4 Castlewood Lane, Pinehurst, uh, North Carolina. Um, I believe it's Duke Progress via Arcadia Power, 100% um, wind. You may proceed with your statement. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition to the Duke Energy IRPs. I am the co-founder director of the Climate Crisis Working Group of Moore County. We've spent the last two years since we formed learning about the growing climate crisis, strategizing what we can do, and taking actions when we can. We are mostly senior members of the community with children and grandchildren from whom, for whom we have deep and abiding love and deep and abiding concern about the kind of climate world we are leaving for them. Many of us are also trained and certified in climate reality leadership. I have grandchildren ages five and one. I'm constantly working to ensure that I leave them a better world than what they are facing now. I've read the doomsday statements. I've also read many statements of hope. I take hope from the Paris Agreement, from the Pope's encyclical, and from Governor Cooper's and President Biden's climate action plans. I was hoping to be encouraged by the Duke IRPs, but I am disappointed to see there is far too much business as usual and far too little significant change, change making action. Most concerning is the plan to increase the number of new gas power plants. This is completely contrary to the NC Clean Energy Plan's goal of 70% reduction in carbon emissions by 2035. I fail to see how building more gas power plants makes any sense, neither in carbon emission reductions nor in cost. That sounds like another bridge to nowhere. The IRP's cost analysis comparing gas to renewables contains misleading data and doesn't take into consideration the societal costs of all fossil fuels such as public health losses from pollution and land contamination and economic losses from heat, drought, and hurricanes, which are expected to increase due to advancing global warming. And of course, the most underserved communities of poverty and color bear the brunt of all those losses and can least afford the increases in cost. Why should they? It's time for Duke to lose the misinformation and tell the truth. What I wanna see from Duke Energy as my power supplier for the future is a total commitment to making sure that my grandchildren's lives will be secure from the ravages of climate change that we currently anticipate. I want a commitment to close, plants, coal, yeah, close coal plants as soon as possible and no new fossil fuel plants, not even gas. Increase investment in renewable energy sources, including solar, rooftop, municipal, and community, offshore and onshore wind, Increase investment in energy storage technology. Ensure that the most underserved and impoverished communities in our state not bear the brunt of the cost of conversion to renewables. Promote the need for energy efficiency and reduced usage to reduce power needs. Promote the development of more good paying clean energy jobs and use your influence over policymakers to support carbon free energy production. My grandchildren will be nearing adulthood in 2035. What kind of world is Duke Energy planning to leave them? Will they be looking forward to the climate crisis being controlled with increasingly efficient sources of power and methods of usage and storage? Will they be breathing clean air? Will the climate be livable? Will my grandchildren be looking forward to bringing their own children into a safe, energy efficient, carbon-free world? Or will it be too late as they are forced to deal with continued reliance on outdated fossil fuel power plants ever worsening climate events, ever increasing extreme heat, and the wish that their parents and grandparents had done more. Duke has an opportunity to show real leadership in helping to solve the energy and climate crisis by committing to a culture of can do about producing carbon free energy rather than the can't do unless we keep going with fossil fuels for a little while longer attitude revealed in the IRPs. There are so many great ways to be the standout, the leader, North Carolina is already second in the nation in solar. Let's build on that and leave ancient fossil fuels behind. I request that Duke Energy go back to the drawing board and utilize the recommendations put forth by organizations like the Interveners, uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Climate, Re Climate Report Review Group, and 
and NT Warren, and as well as the many corporations who have expressed their concerns about the IRPs as they stand, do can do better to show their commitment to reduction of greenhouse gases, which they state in their report. My children, grandchildren, and I are relying on Duke to get this right. The stakes are too high for the status quo. We need real change. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from any of the parties or from the commissioners for Ms. O'Loughlin? I don't see any, so uh, we thank you for coming and participating in the hearing tonight. Thank you. Ms. Edmondson? Yes, the third witness is Lois Nielsen. Right. Hello. Ms. Nielsen, can you, Ms. Nielsen, are you there? Yes, I am. Great. Uh, let's uh, swear you in, please. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you will give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Uh, let's uh, give us your name, your address, and your electricity provider, and then proceed with your statement. My name is Lois Nilsson. Um, I'm at 8405 Camellia Drive in Raleigh. Um, my uh, electric provider is Duke Energy Progress. Um, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak at this important hearing. As a retired state employee in uh, Raleigh, I took pride in my public service and I commend all the commission members for your significant nurse service to our state. The IRPs come at a crossroads in the history of our state, our nation, and our world. They fall far short. We need to seize this day and not squander it. To achieve 70% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030, as called for in the state's clean energy plan, the next decade needs more focused, more creative, and more strategic action than in any of the scenarios that were provided. Therefore, I request that the commission ask Duke Energy to compile a new scenario, a scenario that makes North Carolina a leader, a leader and not a laggard, a state that is responsible to its children and grandchildren, to our nation and the wider world. We need a plan that does not replace coal plants with methane gas plants, a much more harmful greenhouse gas than car burden. Further, we need only one of the scenarios calculated any price added to carbon, but and that price does not come close to capturing the actual cost. What should a scenario maximizing renewables look like? Scientists from Stanford University have done that homework for us. They outline the most sensible mix of energy options for each state. For North Carolina, they recommend a mix of primarily offshore wind, solar plants, and rooftop solar. You can see their analysis at thesolutionsproject.org. These scientists found that going all renewable would produce dollar savings for the health of our citizens of $20 billion. That's $20 billion a year of better health for North Carolinians. That's not just dollars, that's quality of life. Health costs and the human misery they represent are not the only thing ignored in the IRPs. Societal costs of extreme weather are not factored into these plans. Hurricane Force Florence alone cost $24.7 billion in damages and 53 deaths. Last year in the United States, federal data showed there were 22 disasters that cost a billion dollars or more. That's six more billion dollar disasters than our country has ever had in a year, including a record breaking hurricane season. Two of those disasters came home last year, tornadoes in early February in Western North Carolina and Hurricane Isaias in, August, in early August. The human cost of those disasters cannot be quantified. Deaths, injuries, lost wages, damaged homes, businesses, and the utter disruption of everyday lives. Duke Energy states that their primary objectives in the IRP are clean, reliable, and affordable energy. We all know that clean means maximizing renewable. 
affordable must encompass the societal costs and the cost to the earth our only home. We all pay a hefty price for the daily spewing of greenhouse gases. With the cost of renewables plummeting, that fact must also be accounted for. As far as reliability, the most reliable thing about continuing to burn coal and gas and actually adding new gas plants is more severe and more frequent disasters to our state, our country, and our world. We need a new scenario maximizing solar and wind power together to get us to the 70% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030. We can make North Carolina a leader as it has been so often in the past, or we can be laggards. You members of the Utility Commission are the stewards of our state's legacy at this critical juncture. Please do all in your power to make the most of this moment in our history. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Nielsen. Uh, are there questions from the parties or from the commissioners? All right, Ms. Nielsen, um, I don't see any questions, so we thank you for joining us and, and sharing your views this evening. Thank you. Um, Ms. Edmondson? Yes, the fourth witness is Kay Reibold. Ms. Reibold, can you hear me? Kay Reibold? Reibold, thank you for correcting me. Uh, Ms. Reibold, uh -huh. let, let's, let's give you the oath. You solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Okay, please proceed. Okay. Thank you. My name's Kay Rebold, and I'm a resident of Raleigh. Uh, my address is 4108 Yates Mill Pond Road in Raleigh, 27606. I am a Duke Energy Progress customer. I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony today regarding Duke Energy's IRP. I would start by saying that I believe the Utilities Commission should strongly reject Duke's current IRP. In my home, I have a little pillow that says, all things grow with love. I would like to see our plants, the trees, the soil, the air, the water, the life community of humans and non-humans all grow with love in the future. But I'm gravely concerned that Duke Energy's proposed IRP does little to protect and promote the love we all have for Mother Earth. The life community cannot thrive and grow with love in Duke's plan. Duke plans more fracked gas power plants than any other U.S. electricity provider. This is destructive. It is life destroying. The Duke IRP plan needs to end coal production in the state, stop the destructive climate destroying impacts of Duke's expanded methane gas infrastructure and put a much greater focus on renewable energy. These are three areas that are of major concern in Duke's proposal. I care not only about the environment that surrounds me and that would be negatively impacted by Duke's plan, but I'm also concerned about the environmental justice communities in the state that would suffer under Duke's plan that gives little consideration to low-income indigenous communities and communities of color who are always disproportionately affected by dirty energy. And I would say I support NC Warren's recommendations. Um, I would like to emphasize these three main points. First, Duke does not need to build any new fossil gas plants or infrastructure. Renewable energy and energy efficiency can meet reliability needs more cost effectively while reducing bills, pollution, and climate impacts. Second, the combination of carbon dioxide and superpotent methane released as a result of increased use of fossil gas will prevent Duke and North Carolina from meeting their climate goals, and it will lock North and South Carolinians into more fossil-fueled energy for decades. And finally, many of these plants will be economically uh, obsolete in a few years as solar and storage become cheaper than new gas plants. Duke's coal plants are already uneconomic and costing 
ratepayers billions. They need to be shut down now for the benefit of our wallets, our health, and our climate. Please, commissioners, take action to stop Duke Energy and prevent the terrible consequences from Duke's addiction to fossil fuels. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to offer my statement. Thank you, Ms. Revold. Uh, are there questions for Ms. Revold from commissioners or parties? If not, uh, Ms. Revold, thank you for joining us this evening. We appreciate your, your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Edmondson? Yes, the fifth witness did not call in at the number provided, so we'll proceed to the sixth witness, who is Judy Maddox. All right, Ms. Maddox, are you there? did not call in at the number provided, so we'll proceed to Ms. Maddox, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I am. Let me mute my computer here. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? That's much better. Again, let me remind folks, if you're watching on a computer and you're also calling out on the phone, please keep your computer on mute uh, so we won't get the feedback. So thank you. Ms. Maddox, uh, let's give you the oath. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, uh, let's let's try to do it. Uh, we've been very efficient so far, so let's give us your name, your address, uh, who your electricity provider is, and then you may proceed with your statement. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Judy Maddox, 15 Morning Star Drive. Leicester, North Carolina, 28748, uh, and is Duke um, uh, Energy Progress. Uh, first, I want to thank you all, um, the Commission, for rescheduling to be able to hear all of us. So thank you for your consideration for that. Um, I, I am urging the Commission to please re require Duke Energy to retire its coal burning power plants, all of them, by 2030 and replace them with clean energy. I support Duke Energy's earliest practical retirement scenario in its 2020 integrated resource plans where Duke would retire all of its coal plants in North Carolina by 2030. Retiring these plants would improve the health and lives of all North Carolinians, especially people of color and low income communities disproportionately impacted by air and water pollution. Pollution from coal causes serious health effects and contributes to four of the five leading causes of death in North Carolina, which are cancer, stroke, heart disease, and upper respiratory disease. People of color and low-income communities near coal plants have been hit the hardest. North Carolina ranks fourth in the entire country in hospital admissions for heart attacks and mortality from coal pollution. Coal plants are the dirtiest and the most expensive way to produce energy in North Carolina. Solar and wind are already cheaper than coal in North Carolina, and all of Duke's coal plants can be replaced with more affordable clean energy. Yet Duke Energy continues to operate all six of its old polluting coal plants, wasting billions of dollars and making customers foot the bill. Duke's coal fleet operates at a net loss and as a result, customers pay billions extra on their bills. And this hinders investments in solar, in wind, energy efficiency, battery storage, and other cleaner, cheaper energy sources. Cities and counties across all of North Carolina have clean energy goals that depend on retiring fossil fuel generation and need to accelerate clean energy investments. I support an order from the North Carolina Utilities Commission that requires Duke to retire all of its coal plants by 2030, and they should be replaced with renewable energy and not gas. And I thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Maggs, for coming uh, to participate in the hearing tonight. Let's see if there are any questions for you from commissioners or parties. I don't see any. So again, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Maddox, and enjoy the rest of your evening. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Edmondson? Yes, the seventh witness is Joe Adamski. Okay, I'm going to try. Is it Mr. Adamski or Adamski? Adamski. I got it. Okay, uh, let's get you sworn in. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you, you were about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Great. Okay, uh, let's give us your, your name, your address, your energy provider, and then you may proceed. Thank you. My name is Joe Adamski. I live at 1404 Gorin Place, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27603, and I'm a Duke Progress ratepayer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. I'm here because of your urgent and personal responsibility to protect and preserve our planet for current and future generations. The damage to our climate from leaked natural gas and other emitted greenhouse gases is well documented. You have a clear mandate from our only planet and the peoples of the world to end all greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. But you already know this. What I'm pressing for tonight is for the Utilities Commission to challenge this IRP and require the energy future that we need which is 100% clean and renewable energy and storage for all new generations. I'm sure that you've heard that polling shows overwhelming support for clean renewable energy. A North Carolina statewide poll by Strategic Partner Solutions found that 86.5% of North Carolinians would support a lawmaker or candidate who supports policies that encourage renewable energy options such as solar and wind. While 63.8% of North Carolinians expressed strong support for those views. I'm sure you've heard about some local communities passing clean energy resolutions. Uh, I'm also sure you realize how difficult it is to introduce, agree on, get through legal review, and pass these resolutions. In addition, I'm sure you understand that the people of North Carolina are depending on this utility commission to deliver our clean energy future. What you may not know is how much of North Carolina lives in areas that have adopted the goal of achieving 100% clean and renewable energy by 2050 or sooner. I've searched for and brought you just the resolutions that I could find. Well, there are likely more. Every relationship Every resolution I located is included in my submitted material, along with a summary and cited sources. Given the difficulty of passing a resolution, you may think that 10% of North Carolinians are under a clean energy resolution. You may even think it's as high as 15 or maybe even 20. The following counties of North Carolina have passed clean energy resolutions. Buncombe, Chatham, Durham, Orange, Macon, Wake, and Watoga. Also, the following cities and towns of North Carolina have passed clean energy resolutions. Apex, Asheville, Blowing Rock, Boone, Canton, Carborough, Chapel Hill, Charlotte, Clyde, Durham, Franklin, Hillsborough, Pittsburgh, Raleigh, Sylvia, Waynesville, and Webster. Altogether, just in the resolutions I located, 28% of the population of North Carolina have clean energy resolutions. So your mandate from our planet and the peoples of the world, including those of North Carolina, is clear. We have no time to spare and no time to lose. Let this be the time when North Carolina says no more. Let this be the time when North Carolina does the right thing and requires that all new power generation rely on 100% clean and renewable power and storage. Let this be the time when North Carolina phases out all power generation that relies on fossil fuels as quickly as possible. 
Let this be the time when the Commission requires Duke progress to provide the clean energy future we need. I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Adamski. I understand you've uh, uh, made a written submission with the information you referred to, is that correct? Correct. Great, thank you for that. Uh, let's see if there are any questions for you this evening from the parties or the commissioners. I don't see any, so thank you again for joining us this evening at this hearing. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Edmondson? Yes, witness eight is has not called in, so we'll proceed to witness nine, Maria Portone. Okay, is it Ms. Portone or Portone? Portone is fine. Uh, that's what we'll use then. Uh, so, Ms. Portone, uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this week, we uh, this tonight, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, give us your name, your address. Your, your electricity provider, and then proceed. My name is Maria Portone. I live at 921 Mayapple Way, Belmont, North Carolina, 28012. And my energy provider is Duke Energy Carolinas. When I was a junior in high school, I attended the first Earth Day celebration. I truly believed that once people heard these wonderful ideas, things would change. Fast forward 50 years. That naive, idealistic high school girl has been replaced by a grumpy old woman who has learned that the world runs on profit, not on good ideas. We are still fighting the same battles. Still, I was optimistic when I got an email from Duke Energy with the title Net Zero Carbon by 2050. Here's how. Finally, I thought, the time is right. The urgency of the climate crisis, the declining cost of renewable energy technology, and the growing public awareness has finally made Duke Energy change direction. Over the years, however, I have learned to take corporate pronouncements with a grain of salt. I decided to look at Duke Energy's IRP to see exactly what their plans were. It took a while to read it. I found a lot of words, but none of the leadership or bold ideas I was hoping for. As I read, I grew sadder and then angrier. They presented six possible plans, four of which do not even meet the 70% emissions reduction by 2030 goals set by the state of North Carolina. Why spend time and money producing plans that do not meet the goal? Of the two that do, one does it by adding natural gas plants and the other by new nuclear. No plan presented looks at how to accomplish these goals by adding renewables only. Did Duke Energy even bother to try? Duke Energy wants to stick with what they know and continue to make money as they have in the past. This is understandable, but it is not what we need. They admit as much in the risk factors from 2020 annual report form 10K for their shareholders. They fear loss of their monopoly, increased energy efficiency that reduces demand, loss of customers to private solar and battery technology. Let me repeat, they fear energy efficiency. They fear solar and battery technology. They worry about lower demand, even though a clean energy future requires electrifying nearly everything. If they stick with their current course, they have reason to worry. I am an example of a customer they might lose to solar. I don't really want to have to do the research to learn the efficiency of various brands of solar panels or wade through reviews to find a good solar installer. I wish Duke Energy would offer me an easier option to get to clean energy. Duke Energy needs to imagine a clean energy future and then reimagine their business model so they can thrive in that environment. It is time to move boldly into the future instead of continuing to resist the change that must come. Here's what we need from Duke. Stop burning coal by 2030, not 2049. 
no new fossil fuel plants, aggressively expand renewables plus storage, doing our part to help bring down the cost instead of waiting for someone else to do it. I ask the North Carolina Utilities Commission to send Duke Energy's IRP back to the drawing board. Thank you to the commission for the work you do and for the opportunity to speak. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Portone. Are there any questions uh, for Ms. Portone from commissioners or parties? I don't see any. So, Ms. Portone, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Ms. Edmondson, who's next? Um, next witness is Mary Ann Rackoff. All right, Ms. Rackoff, can you hear me? Yes, hello. That's great. Uh, let's get you sworn in then, please. Uh, do you solemnly yes. and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, please proceed. Uh, all right. I live at uh, 45 Treetop Drive, Arden, North Carolina, 28704. Um, we're just like an area in Buncombe County. Um, but anyway, I, I, let me tell you a little about me. I'm Ms. retired. Rackoff, who is, who, Ms. Rackoff, who is your electricity provider? I'll get to that. I'm a rate payer to Duke Energy Progress. I'm okay. also a shareholder. I 100% I oppose Duke's IRP, especially with respect to coal. As I recall, they are proposing to rely on coal for 50 years. That is unacceptable. Buckingham County has a slow to the bond issue, which will be paid off easily and will be paid for with savings from green energy. Our county and our city, Asheville, both have passed resolutions to go carbon neutral by 2030. Duke really needs to show more leadership. They have the technology and they are um, the utility, which is um, empowered to find better energy solutions. And they have not. They're still relying on coal. Natural gas, I guess I can accept that as a temporary transfer to totally carbon-free energy. Um, I'm disappointed that the commission and the representatives or the parties have no uh, questions for the people that are calling in. Um, we are all very, very, uh, committed to clean energy. And I would hope that given that the goals that our county and our city has and that our president has set for carbon free energy by 2030, that Duke would get on board. We look for them for leadership and um, they haven't really picked up the ball, and I don't quite get that. They've worked with our county and our city, and we've done things here locally to reduce the need for a peaker plant. And uh, I don't understand where Duke's head is. Full energy until 2070. Technology is here. Storage technology is here for solar energy. And I encourage you to send them back to the drawing board and come to the 21st century. And I also endorse and affirm everyone that has, speaking, has, speaking, has spoken before me. And I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Ms. Rakoff. Uh, are there questions from the parties or the commissioners? Um, Ms. Rakoff, just uh, for the benefit of the court reporter, uh, uh, just to be sure the record is clear, your 
first name is uh, one word, right, Mary Ann? Yes, thank you, with an E on the end. That's great, thank you. I just wanna be sure we get that uh, in the record. Thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, All Ms. right, Edmondson? thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. The next witness is Ken Brain. All right, Mr. Brain, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, let's give you the oath. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you will give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, um, uh, give us your name, your address, your uh, electricity provider, and then proceed. Uh, my name is Ken Brame. I live in 15 Morningstar Drive, Leicester, North Carolina, and my provider is Duke Energy Progress. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the commission for rescheduling this so that uh, more of us would have a chance to speak without having to stay up all night long. We really appreciate that. I'm sure you guys do as well, uh, and women. Thank you for doing that. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to uh, make a couple of points. I'll try to be brief, because I know you've got a long evening ahead here. First of all, I, I would really encourage uh, Duke and their IRP to make sure that we're maximizing all energy efficiency options prior to building new generation to keep costs low for taxpayers and avoid unnecessary investments in higher cost fossil fuel technologies. Energy efficiency is clearly the cheapest option uh, available to reduce energy usage rather than building capacity. Secondly, I would really encourage Duke and their RRP to accelerate the retirement of all their coal plants uh, by closing half of the coal fleet by 2025 and achieving a coal-free energy uh, production by 2030. Uh, uh, it's not, they're no longer cost effective, they're, they're costing money, and we can actually save ratepayers money by, by closing those sooner rather than later. Uh, thirdly, I'm very disturbed by Duke's reliance on building additional uh, gas combustion uh, plants, and because they do release carbon dioxide, and certainly super potent methane is released during the fracking uh, process. Uh, but basically, if, if that happens, it will prevent both Duke and North Carolina and the cities and counties that have these uh, goals from meeting our climate goals. And more importantly is we as ratepayers will end up putting the bill for that because I think there's no question that in order for the U.S. to meet their climate commitments as well as the rest of the world, that gas-powered uh, uh, electric plants will be forced to shut down well before they're depreciated in normal operational life. And that means they'll end up writing those off and we will have paid as ratepayers for plants that will not be uh, in production. And therefore the cost of those plants will be even greater than projected if it's amortized out over a long period of time. So I think it's important that ratepayers be protected by not making sunk cost into gas power plants that will be forced to close early. Uh, certainly today, uh, both wind and solar are not only the cleanest form of energy, but the most cost-effective uh, energy supply uh, right now. Uh, they're, they're cheaper to build, and certainly the ongoing operating costs really make a difference. A recent study uh, by the Energy Innovation uh, Organization, as well as Sierra Club and others, have showed that the North Carolina could boost its renewable energy by 66% by 2035, at the same time decreasing costs to ratepayers. So I would really want to encourage Duke and you as a commission to, to challenge this hour, these IRP assumptions and uh, send folks back to the drawing board and let's come up with a IRP that reflects where this country is going, where we have to be, and what's in the best long-term interest of ratepayers. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you, Mr. Brain. Uh, does anyone have questions for Mr. Brain this evening? I don't see any. So uh, again, sir, thank you for uh, sharing your views with us this evening uh, and hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Ms. Edmondson. Next witness is Karen Hodges. All right, Ms. Hodges, are you there? Yes, I'm, I hear you. That's great. Uh, let's get you sworn. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. My name is Karen Hodges. I live at 2641 Palm Avenue in Charlotte, 28205, and my electricity provider is Duke Energy Progress. Uh, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. 
I'm here because of my deep concern about greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to global warming. We're in the midst of a true climate emergency with little time left to address it. And what I saw when I read Duke's IRP was a failure to recognize that. Climate chaos is already costing us so much that it's simply not in the public interest to skimp or hold back on investing in renewable energy. And I can attest to that from personal experience. My husband and I purchased a home in Charlotte some 20 years ago, and we did not buy flood insurance. There was no reason to. Our lot was not in a designated flood zone, and the house had been standing since the 1950s with no high water issues. But that changed as severe weather events began to increase with global warming. In one night of heavy rain, flooding completely destroyed the heating unit in our crawl space. Its replacement cost us $10,000, and that was only the beginning. Flood insurance and other corrective measures are a significant budget item for us every year now. Experts project that in order to handle such weather events, flood insurance premiums already need to increase by a factor of four with much greater increases to come. Now, some of our neighbors lost their homes entirely, and the city had its own associated expenses. But this was no Superstorm Sandy. It was no Hurricane Florence. The losses were small by comparison, and they were nothing compared to what escalating climate chaos is expected to bring. The few displaced homeowners did not become climate refugees. No political strife ensued. No one died. No species was driven to extinction. All lost was money. But this should be one more wake-up call that we can't go on with business as usual. It's time for bold, creative action to care for this planet home of ours. And that's why I'm asking the Utility Commission to reject Duke's IRP as it stands. Duke must get serious about decreasing its greenhouse gas emissions, and that would mean retiring all its coal plants as fast as humanly possible and replacing them with renewable energy. It would also mean an end to any new gas investment because gas is not clean energy in spite of how it's been advertised. And finally, I asked the Utilities Commission to set up an evidentiary hearing to examine the figures used in the IRP to support Duke slow walking its transition to renewable energy. We need to see why many other utility companies in this country and around the world are finding practical ways to move faster. I agree with so many of the strong points made by others this evening, particularly with regard to environmental justice, but I'll stop here and I want to thank the Commission for giving me and other citizens a voice in this process. Thank you, Ms. Hodges. Uh, we appreciate your, your coming to speak tonight. Are there questions from Ms. Hodges from anyone? All right, uh, again, thank you for joining us, Ms. Hodges, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Ms. Edmondson? Yes, the next witness is Karen Bearden. All right, so we're skipping to Karen Bearden. Ms. Bearden, are you there? Ms. Bearden, can you hear me? Um, IT is having, they will, they're unmuting her right now, I believe. Okay. And can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you now. Um, okay, thank you, I Ms. Did. Bearden. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Let's give you the oath, please. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you will give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And my name is Karen Bearden, B-E-A-R-D-E-N. My address is 1809 Lake Park Drive, Raleigh, 27612. And my provider is Duke Energy Progress. I'd like to thank you all for allowing the public to share their comments. I so appreciate the great comments I've heard tonight. I'm missing being with friends downtown Raleigh to share our comments in person together. Um, we are in a climate emergency. 
where is Duke Energy's sense of urgency? Duke Energy now gets only around 5 to 7 percent of its electricity from renewables and projects to be at only 14 percent by 2035. The national average was 17.6 percent in 2019. I read last week in an article that Duke Energy, quote, unveils plan to triple the amount of renewable power it produces by the end of the decade to 23% of its total from current levels of around 7%, unquote. 23% is still way too small and is so unacceptable considering the climate crisis we are in. Duke Energy has announced they will be net zero by 2050. We need real zero by 2050. We need to be at 100% renewable energy by 2035 at the latest, using solar, wind, battery storage, energy efficiency, and geothermal. No fault solutions like more gas plants, carbon capture storage, hog waste biogas, and small nuclear plants that Duke is proposing. Some critical points connected to two articles by Bill McKibben, author, climate activist, and co-founder of 350.org, quote, if one wanted a basic rule of thumb for dealing with the climate crisis, it would be stop burning things. Human beings have made use of combustion for a very long time, ever since the first campfires cooked the first animals for dinner, allowing our brains to get larger. Now those large brains have come to understand that burning stuff is destroying the stable climate on which civilization depends. A couple weeks ago, I said that the first principle of fighting the climate crisis was simple. Stop lighting coal, oil, gas, and trees on fire as soon as possible. Today, I'll offer a second ground rule corollary to the first. Definitely don't build anything new that connects to a flame. I urge the North Carolina Utilities Commission to reject this IRP and demand more. Again, we are in a climate emergency. Where is Duke Energy's sense of urgency? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bearden. Uh, does anyone have questions they want to ask Ms. Bearden this evening? If not, uh, Ms. Bearden, thank you for joining us and sharing your views this evening. Thank you. Um, Ms. Edmondson? Yes, our next witness is Kurt Nichols. All right, Mr. Nichols, are you there? Yes, I am. That's great. Let's get you sworn. Do you solemnly thank and you. sincerely affirm that the testimony you will give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. My name is Kurt Nichols. I reside at uh, 9204 Four Mile Creek Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28277. And I believe, but I'm not sure, that my uh, energy provider is Duke Energy Progress. I'm not really sure because all I see on my bills is Duke Energy. So that's where I stand with that. It's most likely Duke Energy Carolinas, but that's okay. Do Please do proceed with is your statement. Duke Energy Carolina? Yeah, okay. <laughs> if you're in Charlotte, uh, please proceed with your statement. Okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the commission for this opportunity to voice my opinion. This is a, a public service that's very necessary that you hear our concerns. As I stated, my name is Kurt Nichols, and I am the grandfather of five grandchildren, ranging in age from three to 13 years. My wife and I, my son and daughter-in-law, and all of my grandchildren all reside in Charlotte. I would like to state that Duke Energy's IRP must be totally rejected as proposed. I repeat, totally rejected and sent back to give us an IRP that states something real. I am extremely concerned about the effects of air and water pollution on the physical and mental health of my children and grandchildren, and in effect, all of our children and grandchildren. If we continue on the path of global climate destruction that we are now on, there is a coming destruction of life as we know it 
for future generations. I want positive action to begin reversing the degradation of the climate and environment. I want positive action, not maintenance. I want all coal plants closed by 2030. Duke pays for cleanup and dispersal of coal ash, not the consumer. All disposable must be in an approved scientific fashion that will not impact the environment negatively and not paid by the ratepayer. Since Duke controls the lakes and waterways, we must also hold them responsible for polluting our water. I believe the 70% clean energy by 2030, as Governor Cooper's clean energy plan proposes, is not aggressive enough. But since Duke is a monopoly, this will not be possible unless competition is allowed to provide and produce clean, green energy. In other words, let competition provide energy to rate paying consumers. Allow consumer solar, a community, I'm sorry, solar and wind power. Price fossil, gas, solar, wind, and battery storage accurately. Do not hide the true economy of alternative power sources. No flat gas plants. In conclusion, we call energy providers public utilities, but the public has no say in these utility companies. So let's take the control and oversight and practices out of the hands of the industry personnel and investment banks and put it in the place, plain sight of the public. A first step is put non-industry public citizens on the board of directors an equal number to industry insiders and investment bankers. In closing, I like to say one thing. Pierre Dancero stated as the first of his 27 laws of ecology, the law of the anoptimum. The law of the anoptimum states, no species encounters in any given habitat the optimum conditions for all of its functions. Let's do our best not to make our habitat worse, but to optimize what we can. Thank you again to the commission for allowing me to put my two cents in. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nichols. <coughs> Excuse me, does anyone have questions for Mr. Nichols? All right. <coughs> again, Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nichols, for joining us this evening. Thank um, you. Ms. Edmondson? Yes, the next witness is Mary Lynn Lyle. Ms. Lyle, are you there? I'm here. Can you That's hear great. me? That's great. I can hear you just Good. fine. Let's give you the oath. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And my name is Mary Lynn Lyle at 700 North East Street, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27604. And my provider is Duke Progress. So thank you so much for having this hearing tonight. I know it's a long evening for you. Um, I am president of Interfaith Creation Care of the Triangle. It's a network of 300 people associated with 67 communities of faith. Believing we have a sacred duty to protect all creation, we are guided by faith, informed by science, and focused on environmental justice. People of faith have a long history of speaking the truth about injustice. Climate injustice is no exception. And um, in fact, we need to build a stronger history in speaking up against climate injustice. Our interfaith network is speaking tonight through me on behalf of people of color and people of low wealth 
who are suffering the worst effects of climate change now, and we're speaking for future generations who will suffer terribly. In our view, the Duke plan with its different scenarios is not up to the challenges posed by the climate crisis. We understand that Duke is required to find the least cost energy source for its power. Now, Duke could do that and still adhere to North Carolina's climate goals, <clears throat> excuse me, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions 70% by 2030. First, the Duke plan ignores the least cost options of energy efficiency and demand response proposing less energy efficiency than in the last plan. And Duke should bump up these goals back to the 2018 plan levels and then go much further. Second, Duke's coal plants are not economic and they cost ratepayers billions and they should all be gone by 2030. Third, Duke underestimates the cost of building new gas plants. It's more, not less expensive than renewables. Duke gains income from building new gas plants, while ratepayers could be charged $4.8 billion for these plants that will need to be retired early if we solve this climate crisis. Fourth, on lower cost renewables that create more local jobs, Duke uses inaccurate costs for storage and doesn't use efficient com combinations of solar and storage. It's shameful that Duke's goal of 15% renewables in 2035 will put us below the current national average of 19.8% renewables. Currently, Duke uses only 6% renewables. And fifth, the plan increases rates for all its scenarios when it should reduce customers' energy burdens and provide debt forgiveness and ensure all families have equitable access to clean energy. So we believe there are realistic scenarios and technologies available to Duke today that can bring us to North Carolina's climate goals and reduce greenhouse gas emissions 70% by 2030. Given the inadequacies of this IRP and its scenarios, I question whether Duke has the vision, the will, or the capability to plan and execute a clean energy scenario in time to adequately meet the current climate crisis, unless, Unless the Utilities Commission regulates in a new, a challenging, and a revolutionary way. I leave it with you and ask God's blessing upon you and upon all of us. And thanks again. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions anyone has for Ms. Lau? If not, then Ms. Law, thank you very much for participating in the hearing this evening. I appreciate it, thanks. Thank you. Um, Ms. Edmondson? Yes, our next witness is number 19 on the list, John Stephen Thomas. All right, Mr. Thomas, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. So let's get you sworn okay, in. Okay, great. Do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you will give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great. Please proceed, sir. Okay, my name is John Stephen Thomas. I live at 116 Shadow View, Leicester, North Carolina, 28748, and I use Duke Energy Progress. Um, also, I just want to know, I'm a longtime member of the Sierra Club. I'm co-chair of the Care of Creation Ministry at St. Eugene's Catholic Church in Asheville, and I'm also an active participant in a group called Energy Savers Network, where we um, weatherize homes of low-income families, and I also have rooftop solar, although it does not generate 100% of my electrical needs. 
I'm just saying that to kind of give you an idea that I put my time, energy, and money where my mouth is. And I'm very concerned about what humanity is doing to a great extent to our planet and our biosphere. Um, I, because of the crucial role and the impact of decisions and actions by util, uh, energy Mr. utility companies. Mr. Thomas, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but let me just ask you to pause for a minute. We may have lost our court reporter. Ms. Garrett, you're back oh. with us. We temporarily lost your, are you able to hear us okay? John McCoy, can you help us out? I think there were, uh, Linda Garrett, can you hear us? John, I'm getting um, an indication that, that she's got internet uh, connectivity problems. Okay. Hold, uh, hold, hold, just... Just, hold on just a second, Mr. Thomas. What, what, what sure, no problem. With, uh, our, uh, our staff here, this won't count against your time. Uh, John McCoy, what can you do to help us out here? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if we want to suggest this, but you want to take a five minute break? And then I, I think that's probably the best thing to do. Mr. Thomas, we're going to come back and we'll let you uh, start up <laughs> again. Uh, let's uh, uh, all take a break and let's uh, just to be on the safe side, let's go to 730. So everyone, please come back at 730. In the meantime, if you're on video, please uh, turn off your video uh, and please mute your audio. We're going to work to get our uh, court reporter uh, reconnected. We'll be back at 730.
Lynn, are you there? Good evening, Kim. Hey, John. Um, Linda lost service, and she thinks it's back on, but we're going to tag team it from here on out tonight. So okay. I'm in for now. You may see her pop back up. Okay. Just to give you a heads up. All right, no problem. Your audio and video sound good, by the way. So you're good. To oh, go. well, that's good because I just got out of another meeting where we all lost service. So okay. So. <laughs> How yeah. long is the break, if you don't mind me asking? Kim, uh, Kim, I went upstairs to get my cell phone to call you. Are you going to cover the rest of the hearing? I'm back in. This is Linda. I'm back in. Good. <laughs> is your internet connection okay? It seems to be. We must have had a spectrum, just must have had a brief blip or something. Uh, yes, I just completely shut down my computer and started back up. So. Okay. Well, how Thanks do y'all want to do it? Yes. I'm sorry. I was just in another meeting and mine blipped out too. So, <laughs> but, but I'm in and Linda and I can tag team it. I'll stay on if something, if I notice she drops out, I'll pick up or I'll just ride along with her. How's that? All right. However you two want to do it. Uh, so Linda, we'll continue with you. Okay. That'll be fine. And I, I, I think what I'm going to do is ask Mr. Did you get Mr. Thomas's name and address and, and energy provider? Yeah. I think I got that part. <laughs> okay, well, let, let me tell you what, I'll, we'll just go back and start him over again. Okay. Uh, and, and we'll just take him from scratch again, okay? okay. Thank you so much. So, so we'll come back on at, uh, at 7.30. Okay, great, thank great. you. Great. Thank you. All right, let's make sure we have the parties back with us. Ms. Ms. Garrett, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay, great. Mr. Mr. Kaler, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Great. Uh, Ms. Kells, I see you. Ms. Edmondson, I see you. Let me make sure, I think we have our commissioners. All right, Mr. Thomas, are you still there? Yes, I am. Great. I, I tell you what we're going to do is uh, let's start uh, from the scratch with you. Uh, we've got uh, Ms. Garrett back with us. And so just to be sure she's got a complete transcript, let's just start your name, your address, your electricity provider, and then start your statement over again from scratch. Thanks to everybody for your patience. Uh, technology is a wonderful thing. Okay. My name is John Stephen Thomas. I live at 116 Shadowview, Leicester, North Carolina, 28748, and my provider is Duke Energy Progress. 
And I started out pointing out that I was a longtime member of the Sierra Club. I'm a co-chair of the Care Creation Ministry at St. Eugene's Church and an active participant in Energy Savers Network, where we uh, weatherize homes of low-income family to cut their utility bills. And also, I have rooftop solar. Uh, I'm, I pointed out, I just saying this to show that my I spend my time, energy, and money where my ideals are. Okay, so my main starting point was simply that because of the crucial role of energy utilities, not just in North Carolina, but ev everywhere, um, they have a moral obligation to society as a whole. They need to take a holistic approach to the impact of their decisions and actions. Um, I know when I was growing up, there was this kind of commercial called like pay now or pay a lot more later. And uh, people have referred to the, imp the, the costs in, in lives and money of uh, extreme weather, of uh, the health impacts of pollution and so forth. So these are all things that should be taken into account um, in any kinds of decisions that are made, not just um, kind of like bottom line decisions as far as energy costs per unit and, and so forth. Um, so I, I think that it, to me, it makes uh, no sense to invest any money, any future money in a fossil fuel generation. I mean, I understand we're still operating primarily on fossil fuels, so it's not gonna go away overnight, but we need to have all new money going into uh, clean energy and then uh, in a step-by-step -step process, but as quickly as feasible, phase out all the fossil fuel uh, generation, uh, especially in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, because we also need to listen to what the international community of climatologists have to say about this because there will be an impact, for example, on sea level rise, which definitely affects North Carolina. Um, and it will affect North Carolina. And there's ma many other uh, negative aspects to using fossil fuels that we need to counteract. And of course, Duke Energy can't do it all by itself. It's gonna, it's gonna require a global effort, but we have to do our part. We have to do our part. And um, if everybody does their part, then I think we can get out of this crisis that we're facing, but it's gonna take a lot of effort on a lot of people's part, including energy utilities like Duke. And um, I'm hoping that the Utilities Commission and Duke Energy, as well as other energy companies around the country and the world also follow suit. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, does any uh, one of the parties or the commissioners have questions for Mr. Thomas? All right, I don't see any Mr. Thomas. So uh, we thank you for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you for letting me speak. Sure. Uh, Ms. Edmondson? Yes, the next witness, and I may mispronounce this name, is number 21 on our list, Norna, Lorna Chafe. All right, is it uh, Ms. Chafe or is it Ms. Chafee? Are you there? It, it may take a minute. Um, IT was having to determine which line. There were a couple, two lines that she might be on. I see, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, is it Ms. Chafe or Ms. Chafee? It's Ms. Chafe. Very good. Ms. Chafe, uh, welcome this evening. Let's give you the oath. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, please proceed. Thank you so much. I am Lorna Chafe of 274 Carolina Meadows Villa, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27517. I have been a Duke Energy customer for 50 years, ever since 1971. Thank you for the opportunity to speak against the Duke Energy Plan. 
I am a 79 year old grandmother from Chapel Hill, a former teacher and social worker. I am a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and I also sing with the Raging Grannies. I have done several things to try to reduce my own carbon footprint, buying a plug-in hybrid car, limiting my driving by planning ahead and doing shopping and errands in one area at a time. I've put solar panels on my roof and I pull down shades and close curtains to keep out the sun in summer and everything I can think of to limit my energy use. I am trying to make my diet more vegetarian, but this isn't gonna make a difference unless our country and the world put this as one of our very top priorities and speed up our efforts to curb our carbon emissions. I have seen terrible storms rip across our country and lately, I have feared the destructive tornadoes that we have had in the South that send us cowering into our inner rooms and our bathrooms, it seems every couple of weeks. It didn't used to be this way. Our 100 year storms have become commonplace. What does this have to do with Duke Energy's plan? It's fracked gas production will increase the methane in the atmosphere because the process of fracking causes methane to leak out of the ground. <clears throat> methane is even worse than carbon dioxide at causing climate change. Duke Energy is going far more slowly in converting to green energy than most other power companies. It's dragging its feet in this critical time. It now makes only 5% of its energy from renewable sources and has the highest number of coal burning plants in the country. This looks so bad for North Carolina, which is such an up and coming area to attract business and new residents. And fracking also uses an enormous amount of water to cool down the drills that are clearing a path through the rock to get to the gas that is trapped in the cracks of the rocks. This water that is used to cool down the drills is a precious resource needed for human survival and in very short supply in many parts of the world. Using it for fracking and then leaving it polluted is a terrible waste of this resource. It would be better to look for more places to harness moving water to make energy, to encourage research to learn how we can utilize wave motion in the ocean and other ways to create electricity. My grandchildren are now almost adults. <clears throat> my grandson is 17 and my granddaughter almost 19. And they have grown up with the fear that their futures will not be as promising as they deserve. I heard my granddaughter say to her father when she was just 11 years old, Daddy, it seems as though the world will be in really bad shape when I grow up because it's gonna get so hot and dry and the storms will be really bad. Her dad reassured her that people will not let that happen. They'll do the right thing and they'll save the world for the future. But we aren't doing that. We are letting our children and grandchildren down and we won't be here. We won't be here to suffer the worst effects along with them. What will they think of us, their parents and grandparents' generations who could have made the changes while there was still time? Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and for your service. Thank you for your statement this evening, Ms. Chafe. Uh, does anyone uh, have questions they want to ask Ms. Chafe this evening? Uh, seeing no questions, again, thank you very much for your participation in the hearing. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, Ms. Edmondson. Yes, the next witness is number 22 on the list, Judith Kaufman. All right, Ms. Kaufman, can you hear me? Ms. Kaufman, are you there? Mr. McCoy, I see her phone number on the attendee list. Have we got her unmuted? 
Yes, sir, but there is no, no response on either one. 17 or 35. All right, let's, um, I mean, she's showing on the list, so let's just uh, temporarily skip Ms. Ms. Kaufman and we'll come back to her a little later. Who would be next then, Ms. Edmondson? Um, let me check with IT. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Number 23 on the list, Lib Hutchby. All right, Ms. 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 Hutchby, are you there? Yes, sir. Great, I can hear you fine. Let's give you the oath. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Great, you may proceed. Uh, your volume is a little faint, so if you have a way of turning your volume up, that would help, we, but we can hear you. Okay. My name is Lib Hutchby. Uh, I reside at 108 Sandish Drive, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I too am very concerned about Duke Energy's current IRP, which is totally inadequate. Totally inadequate. I want to support all of those who have spoken in previous comments who would also agree that this IRP should be rejected and rewritten with the reality of the urgency of climate crisis in the plan. I grew up in North Carolina and I've learned through years of observation and asking questions that Duke is about as transparent as a solid piece of pond. It has a monopoly of electric energy in North Carolina, extracts over 2,000 gallons of water each minute just to keep Sharon Harris nuclear power facility cooled. It makes backroom deals out of public view and has extracted fees and requested unreasonable rate increases for years and years and now seems to still be unwilling to take responsibility for its non-action around the climate crisis. At times requesting seven to 12% rate raises when employee hiring was frozen and no one got a raise. In fact, even if you went to the bank, your a bank account was only, you know, less than 1% or five tenths. So there was no way to make money at that rate. I discovered that Duke Energy will do most anything to make money, to profit, to make their shareholders feel good, but will build totally unnecessary coal-fired plants like Cliffside, and they tried to build a totally unnecessary pipeline through nine counties, risking methane disasters, destroying life-giving trees and endangered species. After decades of claiming to be modern and up-to-date, their current IRP reads like a sad tale written by someone who forgot what year this is. I digress. I'll be 80 years old in a few years. And I remember when former President Carter put solar cells on the White House. That was over 50 years ago. And at the time, my former husband worked at NASA. Over 40 years ago, scientists at Research Triangle Institute just down the road from us were developing the photovoltaics. What was Duke doing? Duke was continuing to, to pollute the air and contaminate rivers with coal ash. Duke, why is Duke soft peddling the climate crisis? I just, I really don't understand it. Uh, why is Duke trying to build natural gas facilities when they're not needed and they would spew methane and it would be worse for everyone? Why is Duke going to the legislature to get our rates raised? Why does Duke Energy advertise being a quote unquote climate leader when they refuse to install solar that can be shared as a third party? Why does the U Actually, why do you, the NC Utilities Commission, allow Duke Energy to get by withholding its users' 
hostage to antiquated energy systems. Yes, it's actually feels scandalous. The words justice and climate reality crisis remind us that all of us are connected. Every one of us are connected. Water is essential to life. And the top three most costly energy producing systems are nuclear, coal, and natural gas, all which require more water than geothermal, solar, or wind. I thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I want to remind you that geothermal uses less water than any other form of energy production today. If you want cleaner water or air, you will reject Duke's IRP and send them back to prepare a more equitable and just plan that acknowledges that the climate really is in crisis, which means all essential beings need clean water to be healthy in this crisis. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak and for your patience throughout these uh, different meetings that you had to plan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Hushby, for speaking this evening. Uh, let me ask if any of the parties or commissioners have questions for Ms. Hushby. I don't see any, so uh, again, thank you for your patience and uh, waiting, uh, waiting with us tonight to speak, um, and thank you for coming. Ms. Uh, Edmondson? Yes, um, 24th on the list, um, Mayo Taylor. All right, uh, Mayo Taylor, and uh, uh, my apologies to you. I'm not sure whether Mayo could be uh, could be Mr. or Mrs., so I'll let you introduce oh, yourself. It's a Mrs. and it's Mayo, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, Taylor, let me swear you in, please. Do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, and I'm Mayo proceed. Taylor. I live at 87 Old Haw Creek Road in Asheville, North Carolina, 28805, and I'm a repair of uh, uh, Duke Progress. I've uh, been listening both to the previous two sections of this hearing and tonight, and there have been a lot of very eloquent people, so I'm going to really strip mine down. I endorse all of the statements that have been made about uh, Duke's relation to climate change and their um, uh, their ability to do more than they are doing, and particularly uh, in abandoning fossil fuel. I'm going to hit one uh, particular part of the plan that I was struck with uh, when looking through the materials, and that is projection. Is it projections for implementation of wind power? The uh, scenarios D, E, and F that do exceed the 70% carbon reduction by 2035 um, have pathways that show no implementation of wind above base assumption before 2029. <clears throat> this is despite the fact that North Carolina has been rated as having the best offshore wind potential on the East Coast and that Amazon has been producing onshore in North Carolina since 2017. Uh, if I had to say so, I'd say this, this report reads like one that was done in a different decade under a different leadership because of course it was things things have changed the political landscape has shifted to make a much more robust rollout of wind possible we've moved from a federal administration hostile to wind energy to one that plans to deploy, deploy 30 gigawatts by 2030 a bipartisan bipartisan group of north carolina congressional members have petitioned the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to begin leasing areas of the coast for generation. At the state level, we've moved from a state legislative moratorium on wind to the North Carolina Clean Energy Plan that supports wind and the governor's um, executive order 80. We've received the very impressive offshore wind study from the North Carolina Department of Commerce that details its interest in the wind industry as an economic engine for the state. So the winds of change have been blowing. 
2029 is uh, seems to me uh, too slow. That surely Duke, with its experience uh, with wind in other areas, notably Texas, can do better. And I would ask the commission to uh, work with Duke and with the other uh, providers that are included in your responsibilities to reflect these new realities and to increase the speed and scale of wind implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Um, does anyone have questions for Ms. Taylor this evening? I don't see any. So uh, again, thank you for your patience and uh, waiting for your time to speak and we appreciate you coming. All right, um, thank you. Ms. Emerson. The next witness is number 30 on the list, Judy Egbert. All yes, right. uh, hello. Egbert, can, can yes. You, uh, we can hear you. So let me swear you in. Do you solemnly and sincerely yes. affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, please um, proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, and my thanks to the commission for allowing testimony about the Duke IRP this evening. And um, thanks to the specific perspectives and suggestions that have been brought up there. I won't M Ms. reiterate Egbert, them. I, I, Ms. Egbert, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let's, yes. let's first get your name, your address, and who provides your uh, electricity service. Yes. I apologize for that. Yes, uh, Judy Egbert, that's spelled J-U-D-I, and then E-G-B-E-R-T, and I live at 713 Champion Street in Clayton. And it's my understanding that even though uh, we pay our utilities to the town of Clayton and Piedmont Natural Gas, that uh, much or all of that comes from Duke Energy. Um, and uh, as I was saying that the suggestions are very valuable and I hope will be taken seriously uh, the, from testimony from other people. Um, the activities and priorities of any energy company in one area of North Carolina inevitably impact air, water, and land quality for everyone in the state. So I think this is, this is a, a broad, uh, it, it, it covers the whole state of North Carolina. And it's with deep concern that I reviewed the current proposal by Duke Energy and saw virtually no commitment to or interest in environmental well-being. Their uh, proposal that reflected prolonged reliance on fossil fuels disregards the well-being of the environment in which we all live. A company may say that it is providing the most cost-effective energy to its customers, but that disregards the real cost in environmental destruction and healthcare that are inevitable with persistent reliance on fossil fuel, as been, has been pointed out by a number of people this evening. The frontline workers who procure fossil fuels as well as the consumers of the products suffer vastly greater negative impact to their well-being compared to people who work in or consume energy produced from renewable resources. As a major provider of energy, Duke has both the opportunity and the responsibility to diminish its role in the growing problem of greenhouse gas emission. Duke currently is among the most polluting energy leaders, again, pointed out by a number of people this evening. And yet Duke has the power and the resources to reverse that, to take a lead in greater reliance on renewable and healthier energy sources. And this is the forethought and leadership that I look forward to and expect from a revised Duke IRP. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts this evening. Thank you, Ms. Egbert, for coming in and participating in the hearing. Does anyone have questions for Ms. Egbert? All right, uh, I don't see any. So again, thank you, Ms. Egbert, for sharing your views tonight. Um, thank you. Ms. Edmondson? Yes, the next witness is Kathy Kaufman. All right, Ms. Hi, Kaufman, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you just fine. So let me swear you in. 
Do you solemnly okay. and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, please proceed. Okay, thank you. My name is Kathy Kaufman. My address is 1305 Lucy Lane, Chapel Hill, 27516, and I'm a Duke Energy Carolinas customer. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. In late, in late 2017, I retired from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in Research Triangle Park after 29 years as an air quality policy analyst. I led Clean Air Act regulatory efforts and coordinated economic analyses, including the employment analysis for the Clean Power Plan. So today I'm going to focus on economic issues. Duke Energy plans to build a large fleet of expensive gas-burning power plants in North Carolina between now and 2034, the useful life of which would extend well beyond 2050. Along with the costly pipeline infrastructure to support this build out, we rate payers would be saddled with increasing costs at the same time that solar, wind, and energy storage, as well as energy efficiency, prices are rapidly falling. Or efficiency costs would be rapidly falling as well. Duke's IRP analysis supporting its plans are fundamentally flawed in ways that several commenters such as um, the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association have pointed out in great detail. And in contrast to current economic trends, and also in contrast to the plans of other utilities around the country who are taking advantage of these trends. Recent well-regarded analysis indicates that due to the rapid decline in the cost of renewables, the cost of clean energy generation is likely to be lower than the cost of new gas plants for 90% of the proposed construction in the US by the date the plants are expected to begin operating. The analysis concludes that 90% of proposed new gas-fired power plants are likely to be uncompetitive by 2035, and I've cited this in my submitted, uh, submitted written comments. As noted in the analysis and quoted recently in Forbes, these changes are already contributing to cancellation of planned new natural gas power gen generation. The need for these new natural gas plants can be offset through clean energy portfolios of energy storage, efficiency, renewable energy, and demand response. These current economic trends should give us all pause about Duke's plans for new baseload natural gas in North Carolina. So consider solar, wind, and battery storage. Solar. According to the United States Environment, uh, Energy Information Administration's latest inventory of electricity generators, developers and power plant owners plan for almost 40 gigawatts of new electricity generating capacity to start commercial operation this year. Solar will account for the largest share of new capacity at 39%, followed by wind at 31%. Natural gas will account for only 16% and mostly in just three states, Texas, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Now wind, with respect to wind energy, DOE has also recognized that wind generation is cheaper than fossil fuel around the country and that wind has long-term cost advantages. According to the Department of Energy, as wind generation agreements typically provide 20-year fixed pricing, the electric, the electric utility sector is anticipated to be less sensitive to volatility in natural gas and coal fuel prices with more wind. By reducing nat uh, national vulnerability to price spikes, supply disruptions with long-term pricing, uh, pr uh, and supply disruptions with long-term pricing, wind is anticipated to save consumers $280 billion by 2050. Right now, North Carolina ratepayers are not benefiting from any of those savings. Energy storage. According to the respected journal Science, in an article titled, Giant Batteries and Cheap Solar Power Are Shoving Fossil Fuel Off the Grid, a 2019 analysis of more than 7,000 global storage projects by Bloomberg New Energy Finance reported that the cost of utility-scale lithium-ion batteries had fallen by 76% since 2012 and by 35% in just the past 18 months. Another market watch firm, Navigant, predicts a further halving by 2030. In addition, in 2018, FERC issued two new regulatory orders aimed at easing incorporation of energy storage. The precipitous drop in the price of storage is paving the way for its adoption around the country. The, the above cited article also points out that in 2010, California passed a mandate that the state's utilities install electricity storage equivalent to 2% of peak electricity demand by 2024. Given the current precipitous dropping price, precipitously dropping price for storage, there's no reason that the Utilities Commission should not require Duke Energy's IRP analyses to take seriously the idea of adding significant storage to its portfolio, especially in the context of addressing peaks. Storage has major advantages, 
It can obviate the need for expensive transmission line build out, making adoption of solar and wind resources even more attractive in terms of costs. Critically for North Carolina, the availability of stored energy would also enable greater resilience in the face of the more frequent storms, hurricanes, and floods we will continue to face. Finally, jobs. According to the most recent data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the two fastest growing job categories in the U.S. have been solar installer and wind turbine technician. Prior to COVID-19, clean energy employed approximately 112,000 people in North Carolina. Clean energy's growth here outpaced the national average at 10.4% between 2015 to 2019. This is far more than employed by fossil fuel electric generation, even though the majority of our energy in NC comes from fossil fuels. Imagine the employment boom we would generate by unleashing renewable energy and energy efficiency in our state. Is, is my time up? I need you to come to conclusion. Yes, can you finish with a okay. final sentence for us? Okay, I, I'm just about done. Do we really want to lock in a major build out of natural gas plants when it's clear that ever cheaper and cleaner alternatives are being taken up around the country? Uh, the governor's clean energy plan, which I participated in stakeholder meetings for, calls on regulators and utilities to incorporate these costs in their analyses um, of the relative cost of different energy resources. Knowing those costs can help you, the Utilities Commission, hold regulated power providers uh, to lower cost sources such as wind, solar, storage, and efficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kaufman. Uh, we appreciate your coming to testify this evening. Let's see if anyone has any questions for you. No. So thank you again uh, for bearing with us and staying with us this evening. Thank you. Um, Ms. Edmondson? Yes, um, Commissioner Claude Felter, we have one more um, witness that we have identified and then I believe we have um, one or two callers that we have not identified, but we will open up their lines after this, this uh, next witness. All right, so who is the next witness then? The next witness is number 32 on the list, Linda Hamburger. All right, Ms. Ms. Hamburger, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Uh, you're a little bit faint, so if you can turn your volume up, that would help. Okay, I'll turn off. How's that? That's much better. Thank you for doing Excellent. that. Uh, let, let me swear you in. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Great. All right, please proceed. Okay, I am Linda Hamburger. My address is 101 Candlelight Court, Durham, North Carolina, 27707, and I'm a customer of Duke Energy. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you about this IRP. As a grandmother of seven, I am extremely concerned about climate change and what it will mean for future generations. The science is conclusive. We need to stop the use of fossil fuels and the greenhouse gases they produce. We know what needs to be done, so let's do it. I would like to suggest that Duke Energy become a leader in the use of renewables. Duke Energy is a major corporation with significant resources. It can do so much better than the proposed IRP. It should take a visionary approach, eliminate the use of coal now. Do not invest in a false temporary transition using natural gas. Be a real leader in the use of renewables to solve this looming catastrophe. As many have said, humanity is facing an existential crisis. Everyone, including Duke Energy, must step it up to address the crisis. There are new expensive technologies which sequester carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, thus keeping them out of the atmosphere. These technologies are important for climate change, but there's another way to sequester fuel, fossil fuels, and that is don't dig them up at all. Keep them in the ground and greenhouse gases are pre-sequestered. The next decade and a half are critical for stopping runaway climate change. Individuals can play their own small parts. I myself drive an EV, I eat a plant-based diet, compost and recycle, limit my air travel, 
and do many other small things. But individuals cannot solve this problem. Only large influential institutions can do that. Duke has the power to make a significant leading impact. It has the responsibility. It is time for Duke to do its part. I ask the commission to reject this IRP, demand that Duke make a real contribution to solving climate change and keeping our planet livable for the sake of all of our grandchildren. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hamburger. Are there questions from the parties or commissioners? I don't see any. So uh, again, thank you for coming to testify this evening. Um, Ms. Edmondson, where does that leave us now? So I have been corrected by IT. We have um, numbers 34 and 35 on the list, and then there are two callers that have not been identified. So All right. number 34 is Margaret Peebles. All right, Ms. Peebles, can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent, and we can hear you. So let me swear you in. Do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, and my name is Margaret Peoples. I live at 838 Heather Lane in Charlotte, 28209. My home gets its electrical energy from Duke Energy Carolinas, but my other significant energy supplier is, of course, our son. Let us not forget. I shall begin my testimony by invoking the spirit and care of the people who came before us in North Carolina, the Cherokees, the Catawba, and the other indigenous people who remind us of their reverence for this place, this land, the animals and plants that we live with in the sunshine, with the wind and under the stars. Long has it all been here. We humbly thank all who came before us and gave so generously of their energy and ideas and song. I ask, why does Duke Energy forsake us? We, their family and friends, their pets, wild animal companions, fruit trees, gardens, farm plants, wilderness trees. Why does Duke Energy forsake future generations of people, animals, and plants? Why has Duke Energy condemned us to breathe more polluted air year after year, forcing asthmatic people to gasp their next breath? Why must we endure stronger and more destructive hurricanes that bring more flooding? Why must we fear decades of droughts, dust, and firestorms? Duke Energy's giant corporate footprints sink into the global soil and pollute the air of Mother Earth. The scientists speak and Duke Energy listens, but only for monetary gains and losses. Duke Energy refuses to see the present and future consequences of its fossil fuel addiction and its devastation. For over 50 years, climate scientists have told us how our planet is losing its balanced atmosphere, baking us in CO2 and methane pollution. Now natural gas drilling and pipe leaks pour more methane into our air, and our atmosphere grows hotter and hotter. Natural gas is mostly methane, and methane is 100 times more lethal at trapping heat than CO2. Now the oceans are forced to absorb more CO2, becoming more acidic, and krill and other ocean creatures now live in a toxic soup where they struggle to create shells and bones. Burning natural gas for electricity is even worse for our climate than burning coal, a faster way to create hell on Earth. The plants that nourish our bodies now find less of the nutrients they need in a depleted soil and are less able to keep us healthy. Dr. Drew Schindel, a noted climatologist at Duke University, and 40 former EPA officials have urged Duke to stop natural gas expansions and invest in cleaner and cooler and cheaper renewables. Instead, Duke Energy plans to build 30 large natural gas burning power plants all across North Carolina. These natural methane pollution power plants and their natural gas drilling sources 
and pipes and transport will increase leakage and venting of methane, making our atmosphere even hotter and hotter. Duke Energy has forsaken us and dropped us all into their coal ash ponds of profit and despair. No profit now is worth the obliteration of our present and futures on this planet. The airport runways in Phoenix recently started to melt in the summer, stopping all takeoffs and landings. The glaciers are melting. More land is exposed to the heating rays of the sun. The glaciers all over the planet shrink and melt and send water into our oceans and rivers. They release into the atmosphere long-held methane created by microorganisms from within. A report from 2019 on Greenland's ice sheet summer runoff showed that immense quantities of methane were exported from beneath the ice. The glaciers in the Andes are shrinking, melting, spewing their methane, as are the Himalayan glaciers, the Alpine glaciers, and the Canadian glaciers. All our futures depend on stopping the overheating of our atmosphere and turning to renewable, clean energy resources like solar, wind, waves, and geothermal. Our breathable futures are right ahead of us if we would just reach for them together. We must forsake this deadly path of greed and lift our hearts and minds to a much better future, a future where we, the people, and other living creatures can all breathe together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peoples, and thanks for your patience uh, in, a, in a long hearing. Uh, let's see if anyone has any questions for Ms. Peoples. I don't see any. So again, thank you for waiting uh, to give your testimony this evening, Ms. Peoples. Thank uh, Ms. you. Edmondson? Ms. Edmondson? Yeah, yes, um, number 35 on the list is Kennedy Good. Okay, and again, um, I could guess this could be either Mr. or Mrs. So I'll let uh, Kennedy Good introduce himself or herself. Um, hi, this is Miss Kennedy Good. Very good, thank you, Ms. Good. Um, uh, let me uh, swear you in, please. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, you may proceed. Um, Okay, my name is Kennedy Good. My address is 2711 Red Willow Lane, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I have Duke Energy of the Carolinas. So, um, good evening. I hope you are all doing well, and thank you for this opportunity to speak at this hearing tonight. My name is Kennedy Good, and I am a sophomore at UNC Chapel Hill, majoring in public health with a concentration in health policy and management. As a black woman who is passionate about public health and the health of all individuals in our state, approving this IRP would be a grave mistake. Since 2020, I've been working with the Energy Democracy Leadership Institute to expand my knowledge of energy democracy and climate justice. Energy democracy is a concept that emphasizes that all communities have an inherent right to choose an energy system that is localized, resilient, democratically controlled, and based on renewable sources. Energy democracy needs to be the basis for how Duke's integrated resource plan is assessed. Many families in our state face utility shutoffs due to the high energy burden and lack of energy choice under Duke's monopoly. The constant rate hikes that Duke would demand in order to pay for this IRP proposed massive build out of new frat gas infrastructure is unaffordable and immoral. As so many people are struggling with economic hardships and health impacts from the past year, we need energy democracy now more than ever. COVID-19 is a respiratory illness. Therefore, lower income communities and communities of color that are disproportionately impacted by air pollution from coal and gas fired power plants face greater risk from COVID-19 as well. And even if we think about the future, assuming we ever return to pre-pandemic ways of doing things, frack gas power plants also generate huge amounts of fracked wastewater that will inevitably pollute clean water, creating a clean water crisis in many communities where these 58 proposed frack gas plants will be placed. It is essential to consider future generations when making decisions like the ones you're making today. Consider all the BIPOC communities who will be put in danger because of these unnecessary and unjust frack gas plants that Duke Energy proposes for no one's benefit but its shareholders. Our communities will continue to be the ones who are impacted first and worst, but please remember that we all will face the consequences of the decisions made today and the future. 
Expanding fossil fuel infrastructure is exactly the opposite of what we need to be doing right now. So think of the health of your family members, your children, your nieces, nephews, and grandchildren as you have the power today to, to protect our health, our environment, and the place that we call home in the end, our earth. Myself and other North Carolinians are depending on the North Carolina Utilities Commission to act in our best interest and make a decision that benefits us, not just the Duke Energy shareholders. I urge you to reject this IRP and to ensure that Duke Energy must do better for the people of North Carolina. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Good, and uh, thank you for your patience this evening um, during the hearing. Uh, are there questions from Ms. Good? All right, uh, if not, uh, again, thank you for being with us and giving your, your statement this evening. Thank uh, you. Ms. Edmondson, do we have anyone left? Yes, I believe IT has just indicated there are what they say are four mystery numbers, so we'll let them unmute them one at a time. Uh, do we know who they are? No, I believe they're going to have to unmute them and see who is right. on or if is if someone is on. Hello. Yes, who do we Hello. have? Yes, yes please. This is, yeah, this is John Reese. I uh, asked to be switched to my cell phone, which may be the reason you don't recognize this number from my landline. Mr. Reese, so, I see you here on the list. So uh, let me swear you in, please. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. All right, uh, uh, if you'll state your, state your name, uh, your, give us your uh, residence, and tell us who your electricity provider is, and then proceed. Yes, I'm John Reese. I'm at 2465 Stonehenge Park Drive in Raleigh, 27613. I'm a Duke Progress customer. and. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I hope it was worth the wait. Uh, I'm active with several faith-based organizations, including Interfaith Creation Care of the Triangle, North Carolina Interfaith Power and Light, and Creation Care of the North Carolina United Methodist Church. I have a unique perspective from both sides of the energy equation. For 20 years, I worked with various industries including the utilities to burn coal and other fossil fuels. In 2004, I went to work at North Carolina State University and went there for, worked there for 10 years in renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. I've been involved in energy and climate issues ever since. As a society, we've taken actions and made progress toward reducing CO2 emissions, but not nearly enough. We no longer talk just about preventing climate change. We can now only talk about reducing warming below the most disastrous levels and finding ways to deal with it. It's time to stop talking past each other. It's time for both sides to start listening to each other and working toward a common goal. It's time for the fossil fuel industry and electric utilities to acknowledge that renewable energy and storage solutions may have greater short-term costs, but are far less costly in the long run than the catastrophic repercussions of climate change. As a large institution, it's time for Duke Energy to take a leadership role in aggressively reducing CO2 emissions, rather than waiting for guidance from the North Carolina legislature, guidance that's not likely to come anytime soon. It's time for climate activists to acknowledge that the cost of solar and wind includes not only the cost of the energy when the sun shines and the wind blows, but the cost of storage and backup generation when wind and solar are not available. It's time for climate activists to acknowledge Duke's monumental challenge of eliminating CO2 emissions while providing 100% reliable power. It's time for all parties to come to the table and develop a comprehensive energy plan that includes demand side efficiency measures and supply side CO2 free generation with an eye toward maximum CO2 reduction. 80 years ago, our entire country responded to an attack from outside our borders with an all out effort to prevail in World War II. 60 years ago, we responded to President Kennedy's challenge to put a man on the moon. 
We met that challenge successfully in less than 10 years. Today, we face an attack of our own making from an invisible enemy of CO2 that threatens our lifestyle and our lives. We can and we must meet that challenge with the same determination and ingenuity as we did in World War II and the space race. We have an opportunity to make America first again. Our children and our grandchildren will either thank us for doing the right thing or blame us for leaving behind an unlivable planet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Are there questions this evening for Mr. Reese from anyone? Again, Mr. Reese, thank you for your patience and waiting this evening. We appreciate your testimony. Um, thank you. Ms. Edmondson, where are we now? Um, I think we have a couple more lines to unmute. Hello? Yes, who do we have? Hello, can yes. you hear me? I can hear you oh, just fine. Oh, Judith Kaufman. Ah, Ms. Kaufman, we missed you earlier, so I'm glad we were able uh, to get yes. you back. Yes. Uh, let me give you the oath, please. Uh, do you solemnly yes. and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, you may proceed, please. My name is Judith Kaufman. I live at 201 River Ridge Drive, Asheville, North Carolina, and my energy supplier is Duke Progress. And after reviewing Duke's energy proposed IRP, I'm compelled to speak to the commission this evening out of concern for myself, family, community, and state. Duke is required to provide clean, reliable, and affordable energy to the citizens of North Carolina, and this proposed plan ignores many of those responsibilities. As for the clean energy component, Duke is currently operating six coal plants, two of which are the dirtiest in the nation. Their plan is to continue operating them all until 2049, with seven, when several of them could be closed much sooner with no ill effects on it, their customers. Additionally, Duke is planning to build several gas-fired plants when uh, in many ways they are more polluting than coal. In addition to providing clean energy, renewables are now less expensive than fossil fuels, fulfilling the clean, affordable portion of the requirements that Duke is supposed to achieve. In order for our state, communities, citizens, and businesses to flourish, North Carolina needs to be a leader in clean air, water, and affordable energy. To that end, I would ask the Commission to require Duke to close all of its coal plants no later than 2030, build no more gas burning plants, and invest heavily in solar, wind, and battery storage. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Kaufman, and um, thanks for waiting with us this evening. Does anyone have questions for Ms. Kaufman? All right, uh, and seeing no questions, again, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. All right, thank you for the opportunity. Good night. Great. Good night. Uh, Ms. Edmondson? Yes, Commissioner Klopfelter, I believe we now have Ken Szymanski on the line, and then there are two other unidentified callers after that. Okay, um, Mr. Szymanski, can you hear me? I can. I'm on the line. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you just fine. Let me swear you in. Um, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, please proceed. Okay, I'm Ken Szymanski. I reside at 4139 Selkirk Road in Charlotte at uh, 28210, and Duke Energy Carolinas is my provider. I was the executive director for the Apartment Association of North Carolina for 30 years, and I would like to speak to the need for discounted Duke Energy rates for low-income customers in North Carolina in the context of Duke Energy's 2020 integrated resource plans. I would note that none of the scenarios in the Duke Energy IRP explicitly detail how Duke Energy plans to deal with energy poverty 
nor does it expand existing programs for the many thousands of existing eligible households who could benefit from both residential and grid level energy efficient measures. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, the Charlotte Mecklenburg climate leaders and a group called One Mech. The IRP addresses cost, reliability, and societal impact. In the past, that has always meant minimizing cost to meet explicit reliability and societal requirements. That has all changed for 2021 because of the uncertainty introduced by climate change, the accelerated pace of technology change, and the need to plan beyond the 15-year IRP limit. Now, instead of minimizing cost for an explicit reliability and societal impact, we must optimize cost, reliability, and societal impact, a much more complex challenge. <clears throat> I realize that the IRP is not a rate-making exercise, but this is an excellent time to examine these issues. The Duke Energy leaders have gone on record as saying that affordability is really important and, in fact, elevated affordable and clean energy as a key component of eradicating poverty in its 2018 sustainability report, where Duke cited the importance of access to basic services. And to its credit, Duke has held the line on rate increases, taking a conservative approach that benefits many customers. The problem is that for Duke Energy customers who live in poverty, Duke's rates are not within their reach because their buying power is too low. 15.5% of Duke's nearly 3 million North Carolina customers live in poverty, nearly 500,000 households. So the fundamental problem for these households is inability to pay one's electric bill. If income is too low, affordability cannot be attained even with relatively cheap rates. An industry rule of thumb is that households should not spend more than 6% of their income on heating, cooling, lighting, and appliances. In Charlotte, the medium household spends 4% of their income on energy, but the most under-resourced households spend more than three and a half times that percent, 14%. For Duke Energy Carolinas alone over the last four years, monthly disconnections for non-payment have more than doubled from 4,900 in January of 2016 to over 11,000 in January of 2020, and now tally over 100,000 disconnections annually. Our current reactive approach in North Carolina is to line up emergency funds to stave off utility disconnections or just let households spend for themselves. A proactive approach with discounted utility rates for poverty households seems smarter. It would clearly lower the hardship of disconnections substantially. In the most recent 12-month period, an average of 26% of all DEC residential customers were charged a late payment fee each month. During that same period, an average of over 9% of all residential customers were sent a notice of disconnection each month. These are signs that residential customers are experiencing trouble affording their electric bills, and of course, this is most acute with low-income households. 11 other states have successfully tackled the objective of discounting utility rates for low-wealth households, including Georgia and Arizona. Depending on income levels, these states' programs discount bills for low-income customers by anywhere from 8% to 76%, or cap bills at a percent of income such as 7, 8, or 9%. In addition to the consideration of discounted Duke energy rates for low-income customers, it is important to also understand the residential environments that these North Carolinians live in. Quite commonly, these households reside in the least energy-efficient and oldest housing, meaning they have to consume more kilowatt hours and expend more dollars to achieve the same comfort level as their middle and high-income fellow citizens due to poor energy efficiency and resultant wasted energy. Here in 2021, Duke Energy does partially address this through provision of both the Helping Home Fund and a Carolina's weatherization program. Collectively, these two programs improve the energy efficiency of 2,300 customer homes through the expenditure of $7.5 million annually. However, at the current pace of Duke improvements forecasted out over the next 20 years, this rate of energy upgrades would collectively only address 10% of the state of North Carolina's low-income housing weatherization needs. North Carolina low-income housing dwellers need both more thermally efficient dwellings and discounted Duke Energy electric rates in order to be able to afford their electricity and avoid the grim and difficult choices they now must make about home comfort or losing their residence due to utility disconnection. I exhort the Utilities Commission and Duke to swiftly implement an intelligent discounted rate structure and substantially stepped up helping home and weatherization programs. North Carolina needs and has needed more cost-effective energy efficient measures to be prepared for our collective future as we optimize cost, reliability, and societal impact. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you, Mr. Szymanski, and, and thank you also for your many, many long years of service in North Carolina. 
Uh, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Szymanski? I don't hear any. Uh, so uh, you you have a good evening. What what's what remains of it? Likewise. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Edmondson. Yes, I think we have two numbers that we wanted to unmute. So we'll go with okay. the first one. All right. Good evening. This is John Hudspeth. I just heard the beep beep. Yes, indeed. Mr. Hudspeth, let me find you on my list. I have you now. Please uh, let me get you sworn in. Uh, do you solemnly and sincerely affirm that the testimony you're about to give this evening will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. All right, so I'm you John. Proceed, sir. Okay, thank you. I'm John Hutzbeth. I appreciate you getting me on. I think I use my uh, cell phone perhaps as my contact number, but I'm calling you from my landline. I live at 11130 Johnson Davis Road in Huntersville, which is on Mountain Island Lake. I get my electrical power from Duke Energy Carolinas through Energy United. And I currently live about 2.2 miles from Duke's McGuire Nuclear Power Station and about one mile from the Riverbend Power Station and Coal Ash Ponds. So first, I want to say I've listened to all these uh, wonderful testimonies tonight and some from previous sessions, and I have a new um, appreciation of the work you commissioners are doing in listening to all this information. So uh, thank you for being so patient and thank your staff for working through this pandemic to find a way that we can all connect. I really appreciate all your work on this. And um, so I served for about six years on the Mountain Island Lake Marine Commission and you know, got to work with some Duke Energy through that experience. I've been active in some environmental activism coalitions in Charlotte. I work with Extinction Rebellion, 350 Charlotte, um, Sierra Club, and also the um, NAACP. And um, I grew up in North Carolina in Mooresville. I watched Duke build the uh, Lake Norman when I was a kid. Um, I know a lot of people that work with Duke, so I have appreciation for the for the people in the company. But um, I and I'll try to just make it short because I know it's. Um, I've heard some some wonderful testimonies, particularly the ones that resonated with me were. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Nielsen, Regold, Partone, and Mr. Nichols. Um, what I heard was several things. I, I heard that we need to acknowledge that we're in a, a climate crisis, a climate emergency that threatens all life on the planet. Um, we need to greatly accelerate our energy transition from fossil fuels to renewables. And we need to ensure that we protect our most vulnerable people through environmental and climate justice. Um, so I think we need to take into consideration the true costs of this em environmental emergency. And I, um, I think that's not being looked at in Duke's plans. I've read through Duke's IRPs and I urge you to reject the IRP. I'm encouraged that other uh, commissions in Virginia and North Carolina have rejected IRPs and sent, sent people back to come up with something that's really more relevant to what our current needs are. So. Um, I believe we need to retire all our coal plants by 2030, and we need to replace those with renewables like solar and wind on our coast. Um, no more new gas. I think that's we're at a point where now we are hearing from the um, we're hearing from the um, inter, the IPCC that we have about nine years to impact this uh, accelerated. Uh, descent into climate crisis. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just blows my mind that we are in the midst of a sixth extinction and we're moving into a whole new geologic era um, that is created by ourselves and our industrial revolution. Um, I heard many people speak from their hearts and I want to speak from my heart and to you guys and say I, I believe in the work you're doing. I, um, I think you may have more power than you than you know and I urge you to help Duke step up to its full potential to transition us to sustain sustainable energy that we all so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Husbeth. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Husbeth from commissioners or from parties? I, I don't see any, so uh, thank you again for being with us this evening and your patience for waiting. All right, thank you so much. Great, Ms. Edmondson. Yes, there is one more line to unmute, I believe. Uh, 
Hello. Yes, who do we have? Oh, this is John Reese again. So uh, I've, I've already spoken. All right, uh, that would be correct. Um, so, um, Mr. McCoy, do we have anyone else? No, sir, that is it. All right, um, thank you all who are still following us uh, and listening in uh, for your participation this evening. Let me make uh, uh, our next session uh, will be on May 12th, that's next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Let me make a couple of, of suggestions to those of you who are watching us who will be testifying at a future session. Uh, as I announced earlier at the beginning, we now have posted on the Commission's website the list of procedures that we follow for these remote public hearings. So if you will go to the Commission's website, www.ncuc.net, the top of the page, there's a, 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 a tab for hearings and meetings. And if you will open that tab and scroll down, you'll see a tab for procedure for remote public hearings. And if you will click on that, that will tell you uh, how it will go for you if you're planning to speak at, at, at any of the upcoming uh, public hearings. Second request I would make of you is if you've given the public staff when you registered a telephone number different from the telephone number that you are using when you call in to speak, uh, we are not able to identify people except by the telephone number they gave the public staff when they're registered. So if you're planning to use a different telephone when you call in to testify, please call ahead and let the public staff know that you will be using a different telephone number. That will help us identify you during the course of the hearing. Uh, again, thank everybody for their patience and for their participation this evening. And uh, we will at this point uh, close the record until uh, May the 12th. Thank you all. Thank you.